Thank you for joining us. Today, we're joined by Shane Kinnar, and we're going to be speaking about myopia research in private practice on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Hey, friends, Dave Keating. Uh, Before we get into the show, I wanted to mention that Team has supported this particular podcast, and I'm really grateful for them reaching out to us, and they mentioned that they would like to give uh, members of the Myopia podcast community a $250 discount off of their first virtual assistant. If you have not considered uh, bringing in a virtual team, uh, I can attest to how wonderful it is. Over the last two years, we've brought in uh, about 10 team members onto our uh, practice. We've used different staffing services and we've had issues over the years with our staff not getting paid, having issues here or there, issues with the communication. And that has been really taken care of since we've joined up with team and their uh, their group of virtual people. Uh, it's been fantastic and I would highly recommend that you consider doing it for your office. They can do things by answer the phone for you. They can uh, check uh, insurances. They can get patients calls they can check on uh describing for you in the exam room and do a host of different things particularly in the myopia community it's great to have somebody that can be in charge of these sort of things checking on those myopic patients seeing how they're doing and giving them a care call after they've had orthokeratology for a day uh, and just kind of be a right hand to you in the exam room or to your billing team or your front desk consider higher team.com, H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com, or click the show notes to get the $250 discount when you sign up. Now back to the show. Well, thanks again for joining us for this episode. We're with uh, Dr. Shane Kinnar, and we are going to be uh, talking a little bit about your practice. Shane, tell us a little bit about you, where you practice, and then we're going to dig in to some of this myopia research stuff here in a moment. That's great. Uh, it's really an exciting topic for us. I practice in in almost the center of the United States in Pittsburgh, Kansas. It's it's a rural setting. It's a town of about twenty thousand, a university of six to seven thousand, and then with neighboring and adjoining towns, we have a draw area of about sixty thousand. But it allows us really the opportunity to see patients across all spectrums, uh, whether that's refractive or treating and managing disease or pre and post ops. And, and as part of that, our practice has evolved into doing quite a bit of clinical research. Yeah, um, yeah, you you have. I mean, that's the thing I've known, not just that you've got a great practice, but this clinical research arm. How did you get started doing clinical research in your practice? You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I always enjoyed the research perspective. And gosh, maybe around 05, I wasn't too long out of school. I had an opportunity to be involved in a marketing study and and that was a great learning curve for me. Uh, You know, that's entirely different than doing a a true research, but it kind of wet my appetite and it let me start to see the basics. And um, just through some connections, there was actually a study where a site dropped out at the last minute. And I uh, said probably uh, overconfidently, oh, hey, I'll step in and cover for them. So I was a rescue site on my first study. And I was serving every role um, in my office, trying to enter data at night. And and that's just grown um, and evolved. And I think a lot of it goes back to the credit of my team. I I have a really good staff that dots every I, crosses every T, and that's what we need in research. But we've now been involved in over 150 trials with me as principal investigator. Wow, that's incredible. So the difference about this with your practice is you're in a private practice setting. You're not in a university. You're not, you know, with this incredible amount of regulatory the same way. I mean, there's regulatory within a study. So how have you seen that to be different from your perspective than we might see from studies that are done, say, from an academic person? You know, I think it's really more real world, and mm-hmm. and I'm not faulting studies done in academia at all. I no, think that is no. the basis for everything we do. But I also think those numbers become skewed because usually patients in an academic type setting 
um, may need tertiary care, or, or there's there's just a variety of mitigating factors that kind of self-select those patients. Mm -hmm. Where I just have a private practice, you know, today I saw a six-week-old and I saw a lady into her late 90s in the course of a morning. So we're seeing everything that walks through the door, and I think our study patients become reflective of that. Mm -hmm. um, they they could be in an office job or they could be uh, working in a manufacturing site farming. So I like to think that our study provide or our site provides that real world experience. Yeah, yeah. Now myopia management is something that you know there hasn't been you know tons of clinical studies that have been done over the years, but you've been involved in quite a few of them. Tell us you don't have to tell us exactly the products, but tell us some of the studies that you've been a part of and you know some of the products you've seen come to fruition really three buckets when we think about uh, myopia management in my practice. So you have spectacle lenses and that research we're seeing in other parts of the world come to fruition, not in the US yet, but I don't think too far off. You see contact lenses, which we're all familiar with the product my site currently on the market and other products coming um, to market, mm -hmm. I think. And then pharma, which we've all done that for a long time. We've We've all known that there was opportunity to treat patients with drops, but we're now seeing some good data gathered on what's the right percentage, what's the right dosing. And we've had the opportunity to be involved in all three of those arms. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, share a little bit here um, about some of the learnings that you've had coming out of all of those buckets and, you know, real world, right? Uh, you know, for all intensive purposes, you have a huge myopia practice. You've just been treating them with different treatments all along the line, right? You're exactly right. And I, I guess when I, when I think about it, if you're treating a patient, I know you have a very large myopia control practice. Do you want them to just have myopia control when they have their contacts in? Or do you just want to introduce treatment when they're old enough to wear their contacts. Uh, there's a variety of factors. And I think that's what we're really starting to see. Um, we're getting some numbers back that we can start to look at. And there's room or need, actually, I should say, for all three of those arms. Maybe a child's too young or they're not compliant with contacts, or maybe glasses are a great fit part of the day when they wear contacts for sports. And uh, you know, pharmaceutical management shouldn't uh, be put completely aside. I think you and I have talked about how it could be in conjunction with other things. Um, and that's mm -hmm. what we have to start to evolve as a profession. You know, we know what's right. We know that it works. We see the shift in myopia. And and you and I have discussed it's, it's a disease, a length of the eye. It's not about myopia. It's length of the eye. And we we can really shape and impact that so now we have to start to marry up, you know, maybe contact A goes great with pharma B or or maybe spectacle lenses C match up with this contact. And mm. that's that's the data we're starting to look at. Yeah. Now, uh, this 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 is going to be a little bit of a tricky question, but how do you think your myopia practice is better or worse than mine? I think that you, your practice, you're very focused on it. It is your, I think, goal to, to make that a, the, I don't know if I want to say the majority, but a very large part of your practice. Mm -hmm. And I think that lends you to be very driven. Um, it's going to be part of our practice because we are so uh, uh, general optometry. In, in where I practice and we have needs to serve several different buckets. So I think in that way, you're going to stay even more at the forefront of what's the best modalities. Uh, I love some of your verbiage and the way you approach it with patients. Um, Let me stop you right there for just a sec, because I'm going to edit that question. Cause that sounds like a really weird question. Um, What, I, what I'm wanting to get at, and I'm going to ask that question a little bit different, is, is the effectiveness of your myopia practice better or worse than mine? And I think you're going to say, well, I have study patients yes. who can wear spectacles and you can't. And then 
one of the other things that I think that I might have better than you is that if in the middle of a treatment, I see somebody still progressing very quickly, I can change them. But in a research setting, you can't necessarily always do that. Perfect. So do you so want you me have to bring some... up both those points? Or are you going to bring up one? I bring it. Okay. I want, I would, I would like you to, so I'm going to ask that question again. Okay. Um, I'm just going to make a timestamp. So we know. Good. Cause I was stammering around trying to figure out how to. Well, get... I, it was a horrible question. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So Shane, you, you've got the really unique practice in that you get to do all this research and get all this innovation and all this new technology, and you get to see it in, in, in practice because you're doing it on research. How do you think the uh, effects of myopia management might be more effective for some patients than maybe I have? And are there areas where you see that it may not be as effective in, as in maybe my practice? You know, I think an advantage I would have, I have access to spectacles to treat myopia management that, or induce myopia management that you mm -hmm. may not at this point in time. And I have maybe certain formulations of drops that are very difficult to come by or delivery systems for those drops and contacts. So I have opportunities to, to provide care to patients that you may not have yet, but you will. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I also think you have the ability, you know, when you're doing a study, you're following a very structured protocol. So no matter what the outcome, you're forced to stay with that unless mm -hmm. you, you feel there's real risk to the patient and you have to abandon the study. Yeah, You have the ability to tailor your therapy. If they're continuing to progress, you can add a treatment or change a treatment. And so I think you have more flexibility in that way. Yeah. You know, we're, I think it was maybe during the first myopia podcast that we did, Patrick Caroline kind of just enlightened my eyes to this in that when we say we're X effective, 50, 60, 70% effective with a treatment, the reality is that we're far more effective in myopia management because the statistic of the effectiveness is from the study of which they couldn't change anything. And so if I'm this effective with the study product, but it's not working as well for these patients, I can modify it and I can be even more effective than the best study product that is out there. And I think that's just something we don't always think about in the myopia management space. Oh, I think that's a very astute point. And I, I think we have patients that have to fall in certain parameters when we're enrolling them in the study. Uh, and, and you can take this outlier that we may not enroll or may not have access and you can really tailor fit and and maybe your starting point is much more aggressive than what I would have access to through a study. Yeah, yeah. Has there um, has there been anything that has surprised you in clinical research? You can't say specific products of hey, this was far more effective than I thought it was going to be. And you know, you go into this mask not necessarily knowing what you know things are going to be or how well they're going to work because they're brand new. Or something where it was like, I thought this was going to work really well. And yeah, it ain't going to market. There, There is a device that I think will be on the market. When I say in the not too distant future, two to four years. Yeah. That I was really surprised by the impacts uh, it had on Axial Link. It was, wow. it was very positive. Um, there was, a, in, a, in a pharma study we were involved in, looking at different concentrations. Uh, I always predicted as we as we move that concentration up, we would really see bigger impact. And that's not necessarily the case. There's a mm -hmm. there's a ceiling there where we don't need to go above. And I think that makes that uh, method of treatment uh, yeah. that much better. Yeah, you know, you you bring this up, and I'll just reference a recently published study looking at um, looking at the concentrations of 0.02 percent and 0.01 percent atropine. I don't know if this is the study. We don't even need to say if it is or was or not. But they were surprised to find that their 0.02 percent concentration was not that much better at all than the 0.01 percent, and. Previous to that, we had also saw some studies coming out showing the variability 
of how atropine is being put out and how, you know, one pharmacy might be doing it this way, one pharmacy might be doing it this way, you know, how stable that product is. And so that variability could be causing one concentration to maybe be a little more effective than really it, it is or, or, or not as effective as it should be. So in that particular study that we recently saw, 0.01% did a really good job and whether that's the study you're talking about or not, you're, you know, maybe, maybe we're realizing that it doesn't necessarily to be as strong as we thought. Yeah. And, and you know, first one of our, our basic tenets is the least medicine to get the maximum benefit, right? We, right. And let's be honest, atropine is not the most fun thing. You, you mm -hmm. don't want to have more than you need. Um, and so I think that that learning curve is, is very big. And you bring up another thing, you know, in a study, we're using a very well-controlled uh, pharmacy um, that we know what products being delivered mm -hmm. and I'd worked with a couple compounding pharmacies before and I've never really thought it through until you just mentioned that but we do see much more predictability with the study patients than what we saw before and so mm -hmm. probably exactly to your point consistency of how they produce it right and uh, you know another thing we don't think about with atropine is because of its um, because of its stability is it actually should sting a little bit when it goes on the eye. You probably see that with your study patients all the time as a, as a adverse, you know, response from the patient, but you know, the compounding pharmacy hears that and they're like, Hey, maybe let's change some things. Well, then it may not be as effective of an atropine. It may be more comfortable, but it may not be as effective. Right. Right. And, and I think you're exactly right. And we want that to be, um, but a little, the sting in the right concentration, the sting is not that bad. Um, but the effectiveness is, is the key to everything. Yeah, absolutely. Well, anything we haven't hit on that you, uh, that you really love and you've, uh, you've highlighted some great things about clinical practice and research and so forth that anything else that uh, we haven't hit on here? No, and just the fact that it is such an exciting time for everything we have going forward. Uh, yeah. You know, we, myopia management um, is right in our wheelhouse as a profession. Mm -hmm. And it's a great opportunity for us to build relationships and, and really provide a great benefit. What's interesting, and I was talking to one of my partners about this, these people we're helping aren't really going to see the benefit for 30 years. Because if you look at their risk of disease, it, it's a little later in life maybe the end of our careers, but what a major impact we can have. Yeah. I always say if we're successful at what we're doing, nobody will ever know. It's a good point. But if we're not successful, they will. Right. Yeah. That's a very, very good way. <laughs> yeah, it. absolutely. Well, Hey, thanks for being on the podcast. Always a pleasure yeah. to speak with you. Thanks for joining me today. I hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for joining me for this episode. Make sure to like, and subscribe, stay tuned for other amazing episodes of the Myopia podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode. I want to again thanks team for their support of this particular podcast. Uh, they have been a great supporter of the Myopia community, helping to uh, make clinicians and offices run better, whether it's calling and scheduling appointments, whether it's answering the phone, helping with billing issues, scribing in the exam room, whatnot. Having a virtual team member in your practice is a real show stopper. So with that, I want to thank team again for their support. Check them out at hireteam.com. That's H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com or click the notes in the show description below. Thanks again to team. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes. 